Good afternoon. It is January 11th at 2.05 p.m. And this is our first lecture videos about Chapter 15, The Rise of Empires in the Americas. And this is just going to be a couple of slides looking at what's going on in North and South America uh, right around 1500 uh, during the beginning of the time period that covers our class. Now, pre-Columbian civilizations, what we mean is pre-European contact. And a lot of what we know about early American civilizations is based on history, biology, archaeology, anthropology, a whole bunch of ologies coming together. Now, around 10,000 years ago or so, Migration into North America begins across the Bering Land Bridge that connected Siberia to Alaska. Now the Bering Land Bridge was, it's still there first of all. The Bering Land Bridge is still there. It's just covered by the Bering Sea. About 10, 15,000 years ago, there was much more water trapped in glaciers, a lot more water trapped in ice, and so the the ocean levels were lower and you could walk from Siberia into Alaska and it's probable that the people who were going from Siberia to Alaska they were following their food source they had no idea they were going into a new continent they didn't have maps nothing like that they just said our food is going that way let's follow it now more recently uh, a second path of immigration has been discovered uh, it's now likely that some people came to South America from Pacific Islands. It's been recently proven that boats and canoes of the time could sail across the Pacific Ocean and that the people could land on the coast of South America. And genetic studies have now shown that people of the Pacific Islands and some South American populations are related. And same thing, they probably came over here searching for food uh, not just for a, you know, a cruise or something like that. Regardless of how they got here, for quite a while, the people who were in North and South America, they were living in hunter-gathering societies. Uh, that meant that they had to find and forage for all of their food. The idea of farming, the idea of cultivation, uh, the idea of agriculture, uh, historically speaking, is very recent. In fact, there are some parts of North America that did not start large-scale agriculture until a thousand years ago. Eventually, though, this food cultivation of things like beans and squash and corn is going to lead to population increases and an increasingly complex civilization and increasingly complex uh, cultural groups too. The first large-scale settlement in North America that we know of was the Hohokam, which is around the first century AD. Uh, the Hohokam, they settle outside of Phoenix and they traded with Central American people such as the Olmecs and the Toltecs. These Hohokam, they did build some pyramid-like mounds. They're the first ones that grow cotton and grow corn. Uh, they're eventually going to be replaced by the Anasazi who lived in New Mexico. And the Anasazi, they're famous for building um, dwellings and homes in the side of cliffs. And what they would do is they would lower down ladders and they would let people into their their houses that they wanted, but if an enemy comes, they would lift the ladders up so you couldn't get to them. Another thing the Anasazi are known for, uh, straight roads that are still visible in some cases used today in parts of New Mexico and Arizona. The first North American culture to build mounds um, are the Mississippians and the Adena cultures. These mounds are pretty cool because some of them are in the shape of animals, others are traditional flat top pyramids. There are even some reverse mounds found in the Midwest where they've scooped earth out 
to make the shape of a snake or an alligator or a turtle, something like that. So some of the mounds are built up like pyramids, such as what we normally think of. Others are actually scooped out mounds where the dirt has been removed. The Mississippian culture is the culture that we are most familiar with here in the Southeast. The Mississippian culture are responsible for the Akmulgi Indian mounds, the Etowah mounds, the Kolomoki mounds, uh, the Creek, the Cherokee, uh, the Seminole, Choctaw. All of those groups that we think of in this area are going to come from the Mississippian culture. Now, the absolute largest Mississippian culture that we, cultural site that we know of, is the city of Cahokia, which is on the Mississippi River near St. Louis. The city of Cahokia was rediscovered uh, earlier in the 1900s, and from all the research that has been done, it turns out it was a city of probably 15,000 people. They have found remains of mounds, remains of burials, a Stonehenge-like figure that was made out of wood. Uh, Cahokia had a giant a giant wall that went around it. And they've even found evidence of human sacrifice in some of the burial sites at the, um, the city of Cahokia. For Central America, the first large-scale group were known as the Toltecs. Now, Toltecs were originally based around the city of Teotihuacan, and I think I'm saying that right, Teotihuacan. Um, it's a city that's really old. It was founded in around in the early 200s. It lasted up until the 500s. Uh, during the 500s, the people of uh, the city they started to rebel against their leaders and a group of people moved to a new city called Tula and the people who moved from Teotihuacan to Tula are the ones that become the Toltecs. They basically take all of the good stuff from the original city, move it to the new city of Tula and they rebuild their civilization from scratch. And the Toltecs are going to become the dominant force for about the next 300 years. And the reason they're able to become the dominant force is because of some technical advances in the art of warfare. They find obsidian, which is a, a volcanic glass, and they figure out how to sharpen it and turn it into swords. And they end up with a short sword made of wood and obsidian. They make a dagger out of wood and obsidian, and they can hack and slash and, and fight their way through just about anybody. Now, the Toltecs, they're not all about warfare. They also trade with their neighbors, and they trade obsidian. Of course, they keep the best obsidian for themselves. They trade cacao, and they trade vanilla as well with the people around them. Existing almost concurrently with them, but lasting a little bit longer, are the Mayan kingdoms of the Yucatan Peninsula, southern Mexico. Their big period of activity goes from about 700 to 900, maybe 600 to 900. Um, it's this huge period of agricultural expanding. They start to build numerous cities and they actually kind of eat themselves to death. Basically, they expand so much and they have to grow so much food that it causes soil erosion and a series of rainstorms come and basically wipe them out and flood their cities and take away all the good soil that was left. Some of the Mayan kingdoms do exist longer than others. Uh, one good example is uh, Chichen Itza. They're able to last a little bit longer just because they were better uh, prepared for the climate change and they were more careful with the soil that they grew their food in. The Mayans are known for several things. One is their trade. They trade with people in North America. They trade with the people in the Mississippi River Valley. They, treat, they trade with the Toltecs and they trade with people in Central America. 
Um, they're very famous for the Mayan calendar, which was supposed to end in, I think it was 2012, but of course we're still here. And they had many of the same weapons as the Toltecs because the Mayans are some of the people the Toltecs exchanged their obsidian and information with. The Mayans, they built stepped pyramids. The Mayans were known for some human sacrifice. And the ancestors of the Mayans are still there. There are many people in Central and Southern Mexico who can trace their ancestry or their lineage back to the Mayan people. In South America, you've got the Tiwanaku and the Wari, and I will be the first to say I don't know much about them, and they're a fairly recently discovered civilization. The Tiwanaku and the Wari, uh, they were residents of, of two cities that were high in the Andes of the Western South American continent. What we know about Tiwanaku and Wari is that they were two economic centers, they were two political centers, and they were two uh, power centers, and they competed against each other. And the city of Tiwanaku and the city of Wari, they're going to create colonies and spread their influence over bigger and bigger areas. They're going to trade with each other, they're going to trade with their neighbors, but they also have this this dislike for each other. Both the Tiwanaku and the Wari, they come up with this idea of reciprocity. Uh, instead of having to pay taxes with money, you pay taxes with community labor and whatever your community labor brought in, whether it's you know riches or food or whatever it might be, there was a community feast to celebrate the community work. Now, our understanding of these two civilizations is still emerging, but what we have discovered is that they were ruled by a, an elite class of people, most likely a religious class, and both cities were eventually weakened due to climate change, much like the Mayans were. Back in Mexico, we have the Aztecs, and I would say the Aztecs are probably the most famous of these these American civilizations. The Aztec group, they existed before the year 1400, but around 1400, maybe 1450, is when they really start to grow in strength. And our most recent understanding is that the Aztecs were probably in some way related, maybe directly or indirectly, to the Toltecs from you know, 500 years earlier. Uh, they lived in a similar area, they had similar lifestyles, but we haven't been able to prove a 100% direct link. Now there was a prophecy where the Aztecs would settle down and build their civilization um, if they found an eagle, I think it was, with a snake in its mouth sitting on a rock along the shore of a lake. And if they saw that, a uh, prophecy told them that that's where they need to settle down. Well, they get to the area of modern day Mexico City and they find sitting on a rock, an eagle with a snake in its mouth in the middle of a, of a lake. And they say, this must be where we need to settle down. And the city they create is called Tenochtitlan, which is built where Mexico City is today. In fact, parts of Mexico City are the original Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. The Aztecs are known for their ritualistic suicide. They would take virgins and they would sacrifice these virgins to their gods. The hearts would be sliced out of victims. That was ritualistic cannibalism. Uh, people were eaten. If your young girl was chosen to be one of the sacrifices, your family got riches. Um, if you've ever seen Indiana, Indian, ugh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, there's a scene in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom that is a page straight out of this ritualistic sacrifice. They have lots of enemies because they fight a lot of people. They took a lot of prisoners and they, a lot of people, a lot of people were put to death by the Aztecs. 
So every time they conquered one of their neighbors and they made a new enemy, and eventually all these villages and all these kingdoms that didn't like them are going to join together and take down the Aztecs. Everybody had forced labor to the emperor. So whether you supported the emperor or not, you supported the emperor, you would be killed. And when Hernan Cortes, the Spanish conquistador, comes to Mexico, he's actually going to use all of the enemies the Aztec have against them. And it is Cortes and about a hundred men or so using the hatred of the surrounding people that are going to lead to the downfall and the, the ending of the Aztec civilization. The Aztecs, 25,000 plus people in their army. They had obsidian swords and obsidian weapons. Uh, what set them apart, though, is that they had dedicated military training schools. So they were very, very good warriors. Now, to me, one of the neatest things about the Aztecs is the way they farmed. Because they set up their island or they set up their city, Tenochtitlan, on an island in the middle of a lake. The place they had that they could grow food was really, really limited. So they built these floating rafts, and they tied these floating rafts to the, end, or to the uh, ground underneath the water, and they would pile dirt on top of these rafts. And so they basically had floating fields, and these floating fields were known as uh, chinampas. And they, the Chinampas, you can find a version of this still in parts of Central and South America, were able to feed the entire Aztec Empire. So it was pretty cool. And then in South America, the most famous group of people from South America are the Inca. And the, they're actually going to be neighbors to the Wari, and they're going to be neighbors to the Tiwanaku, but they're going to become more strong and more powerful, and they're going to take over and push out the Wari and the Tiwanaku. And the Inca, they started the city of Cuzco, which is right along the shores of Lake Titicaca, which is today uh, part of Peru, and the original language of the Inca, known as Quechua, is still spoken in Peru. So. Just like the Aztecs, the Incas are still with us. They have just lost their identity in some ways. Now the first Inca, which meant the first leader, was Pachacuti Yupanqui. And I took a class once on the Inca Empire, and the Inca leaders could all trace their heritage, their lineage in some way, to the first Inca, known as Pachacuti Yupanqui. Now, the Inca had existed for a while. He's just the first one to become the leader of the Inca Empire. And he's going to take power. Uh, Yupanqui, he takes power from his brother in a struggle that happens in 1438. And then as soon as he's got a solid grasp on the throne, he begins this, this conquering of the people around him. And every province, every group of people that the Inca Empire conquered, Yupanqui would move citizens around to kind of dilute the influence that the locals had and bring in Inca families and basically forcibly assimilate you into the Inca Empire. For the Inca, the two things that are of interest to me as a historian, number one is they have that idea of communal labor that I talked about with the Waki and the Tiwanaku, only in the Inca Empire is called the Mita. And with the Mita, you are required, it's no longer optional, you are required to perform some sort of labor, some sort of work for the emperor. And that service to the empire is considered your tax dollars at work, basically. 
to keep records of who has and has not paid their tax or performed their mita, uh, they had knotted ropes known as kipi. And the kipi, it kept a record of the population, it showed who has and hasn't paid their taxes, how much they paid. And these kipi are still available to be seen today. There are um, museums all over South America where kipi are still on display. The Inca, by the way, are also known for their building acumen. They were able to build buildings, like stone buildings, where the stones fit together perfectly and they didn't need to put any cement or concrete in between the boulders. And many of those buildings are still standing today. Speaking of still standing today, there are still Inca roads existing all through the Andes of South America. And it looks like from all of our research, they built 25,000, maybe 30,000 miles of well-kept roads. And these roads were only usable by permission of the emperor. If you were caught using the official roads and you didn't have permission from the emperor, that was considered a capital offense, meaning you could be killed. So you don't go on the roads without permission in the Inca Empire. Now this is only about a 20 minute video. I want to ease you into the idea of taking lecture notes while watching these videos, or at least making it so you can watch these videos multiple times without falling asleep if you need to. So please make sure you do watch this video. The videos are not optional. This is your lecture. This is required. It's still optional for you to join me on Tuesday when I film these. And remember, if you do join me on Tuesday when I film these, it will be some extra credit for you. But all of your information that's going to be on your midterm is going to come from these video lectures that I am giving to you. All right, with that being said, we're at uh, 22 minutes, 23 minutes almost. I'll go ahead and wrap it up. If you have any questions or anything, just send me an email or stop by my office if you're in Carrollton. Um, send me a message in, in Blackboard and I'll be sure to help you out. For this week, the only thing you have to do, and it's due before next Monday night, 11.59 p.m., is that student introductory discussion and your first quiz. And I look forward to reading those discussions so I can learn a little bit about you. All right, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I hope I see somebody next week, Tuesday at 2 p.m. Until then, bye-bye.